There we go. <laughs> excellent, excellent. We'll go. There we go. <laughs> well, welcome, 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 welcome. What is to be probably an absolute evening of hilarity. Um, oh, Ben Brown, what time does this start? Well, we're starting now. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> welcome, 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 as always, to our wonderful uh, live stream, as always, on a, on a Wednesday. Uh, decided not to actually publicize it, <laughs> which, again, a um, bit of a mistake on my part, but there you go. Uh, <laughs> I, I did not realize the hilarity that was going to ensue, to be honest, because here's the thing. Liz Truss should be the most ridiculed name in all of politics. Like, no no questions asked whatsoever. She should be and remain the most ridiculed name for the rest of her life. Even on her gravestone, she should have carved on it shortest prime minister in history. <laughs> and I think people should ensure that happens because it is a nightmare still that in certain sections, mainly, of course, the, the well, the loony, ridiculous, uh, far-right, free-market fundamentalists out there who worship these ideas of a low-tax, low-regulation uh, paradise, but, of course, they can't actually explain what regulations they want to get rid of and how low taxes should be and what that might mean for maybe public services spending, but, of course, that remember, small government. Uh, basically meaning they don't want the government to perform certain functions. That's what they mean when they mean small government. They're not about shrinking the size of the of the civil service or anything like that. No, they basically mean our government should not perform functions, and in, in certain functions, full stop. Like, that is what they mean when they say this. <laughs> so get ready, because, oh my... Um, Oh me, oh my! <laughs> I, I I hope you're ready for uh, <laughs> for some hilarity this evening. Oh, this is uh, this is indeed going to be fun. Ah, <laughs> oh. so without further ado. Ladies and gentlemen, um, let us dive into, given to us by the um, Heritage Foundation, a a a a, a dark money <laughs> um, funding group. Um, this is oh number three. <laughs> Hello, what is this? Well, this is Liz Truss's speech to the Heritage Foundation. This is her giving the Margaret Thatcher. Freedom address. <laughs> I, I kid you not. This is what this this is. This is this is Liz Truss giving a a lecture on financial stability. Exactly. <laughs> I can I can hear the laughter echoing down the stream already, but yes, this is seriously Liz Truss about to give a a a a, 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 a completely irony laced lecture about sensible economic spending. <laughs> she has absolutely. Very true. She has gone absolutely, totally crazy. Um, yeah, <laughs> as we we are about to find out. <laughs> oh boy! Oh boy! Oh boy! Special guest, and this year's lecturer. And I have to say, the audio for this is the awful. Margaret Thatcher Freedom Lecture, and that is the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Liz Truss. 
You know that Prime Minister Truss spoke for free people all over the world. For those of us who are Americans, we have a special affection for her because she delivered finally on Brexit. She confronted the big tax, big government establishment in her country, and dare I say, even her own party, something we at the Heritage Foundation have some familiarity with in the Imperial City. And most of all, I would say in her quintessential British wit, delivered so in good cheer. And now is focused as Heritage is on revitalizing self-governance and conservatism around the world, but particularly in the Anglosphere. So here at Heritage, where we have a long we special relationship as part of that we'll special relationship <laughs> between the United States and the United Kingdom. And of course, as you know, we had a long institutional friendship with so many organizations in the UK, and in particular with the Iron Lady herself. It is a great pleasure that this year delivering the Margaret Thatcher Freedom Lecture is the Prime Minister, Liz Truss. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Spe indeed. Yeah, I, I, I agree there. Yeah, special thanks to Flamingo Land indeed for giving her <laughs> a day release. <laughs> yep, she's climbed out from under the rock, I see. Yep. Oh, yes. Um, I can say it should be noted that this is actually um, part of Liz Truss's attempt to try and get back in the good graces of of conservatism mainly uh uk conservatism <laughs> because well um she's complete she's completely destroyed really any chance of a career and i i initially have already done a a video released tomorrow giving my thoughts of at least some of this stuff in this speech that had been leaked to the press um about what she was going to say but trust me, you haven't heard anything yet. And yes, I did use a little pun there. <laughs> oh, we, we've got to try and find some some good stuff when we can, right? <laughs> like I say, we're we're about to listen to a Liz Trust speech. Can you blame me? Oh, let's crack on with this then, because it's yeah, it, it's painful enough as it is. <laughs> Very good to be here. Awkward as ever. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. It's fantastic to be here at the Heritage Foundation, 50 years after this great institution was established, 50 years of fighting for freedom, 50 years of taking on the corporatist consensus, 50 years of arguing against communism, against collectivism, against socialism. And I'm delighted to see that you're establishing a new freedom center. It says outside Freedom Center coming soon. Well, it couldn't come soon enough because we need we need more freedom. Already in her opening, um, I I think I counted about um, six times she said freedom in one sentence. <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> Why on earth? Why on earth would you do this? Liz Truss is just as bad a public speaker as ever. And it's only going to get worse. <laughs> it's only going to get worse. And I'm also hugely honoured to be giving this year's Margaret Thatcher lecture. Just... 10 years after her passing away. A very sad moment, but we know that her ideas live on. It's almost a few years, well, it's over 30 years since the end of the Cold War. And I think we all remember how it felt at the time. The excitement that we felt, the hope that we felt that freedom and democracy had won that we were entering a new era of prosperity, a new era of hope, a new era of freedom for all of the world. But we yeah. have to ask ourselves now, how do we feel now? Do yeah, 
Exactly, yeah. The sheer intensity of trust and stupidity puts the nuclear fission to shame. Exactly. If only, if only we could harness her stupidity for the, for the good of Britain. <laughs> the power we could generate. We could power the world. Maybe the UK. Maybe the world. Who knows? We have yet to really um, plumb the depths of the of the sheer power of Liz Truss's stupidity. Yeah. <laughs> Freedom. Every time freedom mention equals one shot. Um, yeah, you might. Oh, uh, you might not last long at that point. <laughs> you might. You might not last long uh, at this point. In fact, I, I should have. This is wish. I, I wish I could actually have a a counter, um, just to count how many times she said freedom. <laughs> but yeah, and it, it is. It's the. It is the Margaret Thatcher lookalike contest. You are exactly right. <laughs> That was that was held shortly after the after Liz Truss's speech, where Liz Truss got to um, award the winner of the of the uh, the Margaret Thatcher lookalike contest with a wonderful new handbag. <laughs> oh, do we feel freer? Do we feel that free enterprise has triumphed? Do we feel? that we are able to say what we think in an open society? And I'm afraid the answer to all three of those questions is no. What? Who is, who is stopping enterprise in the UK? Who is, who is stopping enterprise? Who is, who is stopping freedom of speech in the UK? This is tr this is Truss, I think, desperately trying to double down. Um, either either a, this is part of a big grand big grand strategy, uh, in an attempt to return to to politics in 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 some way, backed by a lot of shall we say, um, well dark shadowy money coming in from the U.S. to to try and, well actually get her economic ideas on the books this time and actually have them work or she's trying to angle in some way shape or form to become sort of u.s lobbyist um and promote these nonsense ideas I, it could be really one of the two but like i say at least it's 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 always good to know that she's she's got a career peddling this nonsense you know if she ever retires as an mp like i say who knows we'll find out We'll probably find out the next general election. <laughs> and what I want to talk about today is how is it, after the massive triumph of our ideas, that core Anglo-American heritage that won the Cold War, how is it after the triumph of those ideas that we now find ourselves on the defensive? We find ourselves on the back foot. And key ideas... Because maybe the ideas that you're trying to push um, are like really, really crazy ideas, like the fact that companies should be able to do whatever the hell they want, and no one should be able to say a thing about it or even punish them. Company puts out a product which does harm, well, that's on the consumer for not looking properly, right? No, well, this is this is some of the nonsense that the Heritage Foundation loves to pump out. Um, like I say, this is a, a free market libertarian uh, think tank that pumps out all the nonsense. You know, they want no government involved in any sort of market regulation whatsoever. That's their ultimate aim, their ultimate goal. It's the same one that Trust now shares because that's how I think she thinks she can potentially get back into power um like i say anyone who ever lets her near anyone who ever lets her near any any levers of power ever again um would be absolutely out of their mind um certainly certainly she just should not be anywhere near i'm to be honest surprised that the conservatives haven't made moves to really keep her out um 
even more. I mean, I know she's, like I said, she said she's been pretty much living under a rock, but she is attempting somewhat of a comeback tour. Like the idea that the best people to make decisions are about their own lives of people and their families, or the ideas that growth powered by free enterprise is the best way to create prosperity for our countries, or the idea that it's about your individual characteristics that are important, your hard work and your talent, not what sex you are or what race you are. Those things are not so important. I th that is just a load of nonsense. I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I just don't even know what to, to respond to that. I just don't know how to respond. That That was just like... I don't know. That was like culture war word salad. That that was literally what was just spewed there. <laughs> just what? Oh dear. Um, but yes. Um, like I say, if you want to know where all this culture war nonsense is uh, is coming from, well, like I say, just look at the flag in the background, and of course, check the uh, check the name as well. The Heritage Foundation, as many as well as the other um, ridiculous. Well, I say ridiculous. Um, very sort of dark, shady, uh, murky companies, all based suspiciously at 55 Tufton Street. S strange how all these um, free market libertarian uh, sort of charities, <laughs> as they as they like to call themselves, somehow are all based at the same address. <laughs> magical, magical that indeed. How is it that those ideas have fallen by the wayside? How is it that these ideas have been lost? And that us well, if you're going to put this forward as a as a premise that you have that these things have been lost, free enterprise, freedom of speech, you might want to actually start saying how they no longer exist. Not that they just don't exist, but this is how we lost them. Now, maybe she'll get more into that in her speech later on. It's it's entirely possible, but like I say, we'll see. Sense of self-belief seems to be dissipating. It was Margaret Thatcher's great ally, Ronald Reagan, who said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. Well, I'm afraid that we are dangerously close to that point now. The fact is that people who hate freedom have been gaining ground. We know that there are proportionally fewer people living in democracies now than there were when Mrs. Thatcher left office. And we can see across the world our opponents and our adversaries acting with impunity. Whether it's Vladimir Putin and his appalling invasion of Ukraine, an unprovoked invasion of a free democracy, or whether it's President Xi and the build-up of armaments in China and the menacing of the free and democratic Taiwan. And all this time, what we've seen is we've seen accommodation and appeasement by the West of these authoritarian regimes. <laughs> oh yeah, um, yeah. We've we've just been accommodating and and appeasing Putin. We haven't done anything to stop his invasion of Ukraine. No, I think there are ways we could go harder, but I think that the sanctions we have put on uh, Russia, crippling their economy. Um, You know, I, I, I can't say that we haven't just sat by and done nothing. So I, I certainly disagree with her, her premise on um, you know, I hate to say that she's tried to sort of do that. Yeah, dear, but yeah, Tories are still taking Russian money. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Uh, exactly, you know, Tories and uh, and even Republicans have taken, uh, you know, Russian money in the past. That's that's not a secret. Why have they been taking Russian money and you know Russian oligarch money for what purpose? <laughs> Which again, I wouldn't be surprised if if Truss herself was maybe at some point a recipient of of maybe some uh, you know Russian money, uh, certainly donated on behalf of her to the Conservative Party. <laughs> we allowed China to join the World Trade Organization on very favorable terms. 
and they are still designated a developing country. We saw Europe become... Okay, this is, this is an actual uh, classic conservative talking point. So there are, in terms of um, how economies are sort of classified, you've got advanced economies, developing economies, and... Oh, what's the third one called now? But it doesn't matter. So a developing economy, economy especially, means you take a look at all the economy. And for all of China's economic development, only about 12%, 12% of China is actually industrialized. Like, bear in mind how massive China is with its massive population. Only 12% of China is industrialized. Now, when you look at how you classify, how, how these are classified, China doesn't actually fit into the definition of an advanced economy. Because... Even though it has all these factories, all these stuff, and it can pump out all these goods, that's only from just 12% of its entire sort of area that it is actually industrialized. For all this talk of how amazing the, the, the Chinese economy is and how wonderful it is, there's a lot of realities that people don't generally tend to talk about and like i say i'm not a full expert on china but it is still believe it or not a developing economy even though people like um you know as liz trust said oh it's a it's, we we've labeled it a developing economy yeah because it, it still is a developing economy under all the definitions of how it is how we define what a developing economy is china is still a developing economy it just has so much manpower, so much manpower that it can act, or at least in many ways pretend and compete with advanced economies. That's just the, the reality of the situation is, and people like this trust just go, oh, well, I'll complain about it. Well, yeah, but it still fits into the definition of what is classed as and also, if Liz Truss wants to complain about the WTO, um, I don't remember Liz Truss complaining about Donald Trump pretty much destroying the WTO by not appointing judges to the World Trade Organization, thus not thus being creating a massive backlog of cases to try and be solved. Will she criticize Donald Trump here? I don't know. I doubt it. <laughs> I'm dependent on Russian gas at the same time as we were talking about climate change. We were importing more and more Russian gas and pouring more and more money into the coffers of Vladimir Putin. And what I think those regimes saw is they saw our weakness. They saw our lack of belief in ourselves. And they weaponized that weakness. They weaponized... Wait, what? So... Putin saw a a lack of belief. Don't you mean you think you meant Putin seemed to think that the uh, at least or at least Europe was massively dependent on Russian gas and Russian oil? So he basically took under the or basically lived under the delusion that he could um, basically take large swathes of Ukraine. And Europe would do nothing about it because they would never, ever threaten the oil and gas supply that they get from Russia. Seems to me that's a more likely scenario than Putin just knew that, you know, we weren't confident in ourselves enough. <laughs> that lack of belief, and they stirred it up in our countries. And this... They stirred it up in our countries. Okay, that's an interesting admission. Because Liz Truss has just admitted that Russian interference 
may have actually then played a part in Brexit. Which, if she did, she has been denying the fact that Russian interference was not even a thing at the Brexit referendum. This is despite the fact that it was those core beliefs, those core tenets, that made the world prosperous in the first place. The fundamental idea of freedom and self-determination, so different from the top-down tyranny of Russia and China. Those ideas made us happier and they made us stronger. The ideas of low taxes, limited government and free enterprise, those were the ideas that won the Cold War by giving us the economic strength to succeed. <laughs> no, 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 they didn't. <laughs> again, um, again, low taxes, small government and what was it? Freedom of enterprise, I believe it was. Free enterprise. Those no, were the free ideas enterprise. that won the Cold War. So... The, the, so let's go from these. So free enterprise. Um, we were a capitalist country versus what? Uh, the the communist one, which wasn't a a full communist because there was technically a market economy in the Soviet Union. Um, so technically, yes, free enterprise did win because economically. Um, you know, that's what proved to help. <laughs> and exactly, Colin Thompson does get it right. Yeah, the massive American defense budget, which was, again, in part funded by, well, the success that was, um, you know, capitalism, which was, again, does promote free enterprise. But again, this is throwing around buzzwords. What does libertarians like Liz Truss actually mean when they mean free enterprise, what do they mean by this? It's it, the, this is this usual, usual talk of we'll say a buzzword, but we won't actually go into what that buzzword means or what we mean by saying that buzzword. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, the, the, the Cold War was, was as again, as, as people in the chat have pointed out, Colin and uh, GC have pointed out, it was because America was just able to outspend the Soviet Union. Like I say, uh, the Soviet Union's defense budget, the fact that it could no longer pay for its, its colossal defense budget, was a big contributor to its collapse. So... There's a ton of stuff that goes on there. And then, of course, what about small government? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but America and the UK during sort of the, the, the Cold War, especially, and I'm not, I can't say uh, again for America because I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in that sort of arena to be able to say it, but certainly from, um, you know, 1945 right up until sort of the end of the Cold War, uh, you know, 1989, I suppose, if you want to um, use that as, as sort of the, the end date, the government got bigger. And it got bigger because the government found it had to do more stuff. British people voted the government in because it wanted to do more stuff. We saw bigger you know, regulatory bodies. We saw, you know, an expansion of, of sort of whole different sort of areas and departments, not because it had to get small, because they had to get bigger. Because there was more stuff for a government to do. <laughs> uh, GC, uh, BHM, the USSR was not a market economy, except um, the peasants, the military, was a command economy, thereby inefficient. Um is there a difference? Um, they will probably argue that there is a difference, GC. Um, you know, they will always they will always say that, you know, especially sort of these libertarian, you know, free market fundamentalists, they are basically obsessed and run on the idea that the government should have absolutely nothing to do in in, in sort of any business whatsoever, and that includes regulations or any laws or anything like that. Like, government uh, should have nothing to do 
with the markets whatsoever and should stay out of it completely. That is what really they mean. But of course, that means getting rid of thousands of, of sort of regulations that protect consumers, the environment, uh, all kinds of stuff. We, we, we've talked about this problem before. We've talked about this continuously recently in the run-up to the Brexit and the whole Jacob rees Mog bill on this. Yeah. <laughs> That's another good point. Yeah, small government. Yeah, the country rebuilt itself um, after the war without intervention. Yeah, sure. Ex exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um it's not a, a an actual reflection on what actually happened. By giving us the economic strength to succeed. And what I worry about now is that we're seeing these economic ideas, this economic model, strangled into stagnation. We're facing threats. How? how how is how is this economic model being strangled into stagnation <laughs> from within and without a few weeks ago we saw president xi visit moscow and we can see more clearly than ever that russia and china those two authoritarian regimes are working together china is buying influence around the world through its belt and road initiative and other which is failing by the way um this whole Belt and Road initiatives that, it, that, it's, that it's trying to do, this sort of realignment and sort of build new Silk Roads to these um, sort of countries to sort of secure its own uh, long-distance supply lines. When you look at sort of uh, economists or people that are, are, are actually sort of looking at this, the, the, the Belt and Road initiative, they all come back and say, these, these roads, these ports that are meant to have been built haven't been built or when they have been built they've fallen into absolute disrepair and they haven't seen the level of traffic that was at least they should expect to see if they were meant to be this brand new uh, version of the of the silk road it hasn't sort of materialized as as china would have hoped for and especially in africa um some of the countries that have received money to to sort of build uh, sort of new roads, new ports. Well, they haven't been built because it's fallen to that, you know, that as we've seen before in, in, in Africa, sometimes where this happens quite a lot, uh, corruption comes into play. They, the money goes and then only gets maybe half spent or, you know, so it hasn't really been spent and been a massive success that uh, especially what Liz Truss is claiming. It has not been the overwhelming success even China has hoped for. Uh, security agreements. We can see Russia with the Wagner Group working in parts of Africa, working in parts of Eastern Europe, seeking instability. We should have no doubt about what their intentions are. What they want is their version of the world to prevail. That is what is under threat. And they're pretty blunt about it. As Sergei Lavrov, who was my counterpart when I was foreign secretary, said, this isn't about Ukraine at all. It's about the world order. Now, in response to this, what we've seen are some elements of isolationism here in the United States and <laughs> elsewhere. People say, well, we shouldn't really care about this. Yes, isolationism. <laughs> isolationism. Um, absolutely not. There has been absolutely over, overwhelming um, sort of <laughs> response to the world from you know there's been a massive response to the sort of the invasion of ukraine as there will probably be a massive international outcry on uh, taiwan and certainly china has looked at what has gone in russia and looked to the fact that russia has essentially been sanctioned almost into oblivion at this point it's its economy is 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 barely just holding together and it looks now it looks now and it goes well if we went and took Taiwan, would we be able to survive being cut off all these all these sanctions, all the international condemnation? There's there's not a lot of really now support in China to be able to do that because that has made them rethink their plans on Taiwan.
And one of the reasons why countries have been going, especially sort of Macron and Ursula von der Leyen, went to China to see Xi and say, hey, you need to put pressure on Putin because you're one, you're a big influence that can help to stop this. You know, that that's diplomacy 101. And yet Liz Trust looks at that and just goes, Phew, that's that's just a sign of weakness. Here's the thing. What I find many of these uh, people have this worldview of, of China. Is China good? No, not really. But there are things we can do to, to sort of put influence on that. And unfortunately, it is very sort of soft influence that we can only apply. But eventually, we can hope China can get better. And that's the hope I think we should have. Because you cannot just ignore China and just hope it goes away. Because that's what many views of, of the conservatives uh, around the world, especially on China, are. That you can just put China back in its box and it will just go away. It will just stop to cease be a problem. But no, China is, is, is part of the world. And isolating China which is, seems to be the strategy of many conservatives. You just isolate China, it'll just go away. Doesn't seem to be working. And that foreign policy of ignore China has not worked. So we've got to find a different way to, to sort of deal with China, just as we've got to now find, I think, a different way to now deal with uh, Russia. You know, so long as Putin is in charge... You cannot treat Russia like a normal country. You know, he's he's acting like a, well, a, a basically a conquering dictator. I will go into Ukraine. I will take that land. And he's taken far more land than he even initially said that they wanted to. And what's also worrying is this looks like there's also been plans to get Moldova in as well. When you look at the recent coup attempt that they uncovered. So there is there is a you know a, a lot to be said, but it's it's looking at how we can do this, and this idea that we are being soft on on Putin and and Z. No, I I completely disagree. I think at the moment we are probably being a lot harder on certainly on Russia and Putin than anyone ever really expected. No one expected there to be such a combined effort. from the West in response to Ukraine. But then it just goes to show you, Liz Truss was not really good at her job when she was Foreign Secretary. It's in a different continent. It doesn't really matter to the concerns of American citizens. What we should be worrying about is China. That's the real economic threat to the United States. That's the real threat that we face today. But can you imagine what would happen if Vladimir Putin was successful in Ukraine? If he was successful at extinguishing a free democracy? What lesson would President Xi take from that? He would take the lesson that he could act with impunity with respect to Taiwan. It would embolden him and it would embolden Russia to do more in Europe. I actually agree with that. That is, that is why we should make sure that Putin fails, that we ins we insist that this whole idea that you can just go in and just go, Pump, that part is mine now, thanks, bye, we should not encourage, <laughs> you know, we should not encourage this, this colonial attitude. Um, but that's what sort of Putin wants to try and, and sort of get back to, you know, Oh, that was part of Russia. That was part of Russia. That was part of Russia as well. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> An invasion of Taiwan wouldn't just be a threat to freedom and democracy in Taiwan, which is, of course, important. And it wouldn't just be a threat to freedom and democracy around the world. It would be a direct economic threat to us in Europe and you on the other side of the Atlantic, whether it's the semiconductors 
that power so much of our high-tech industry, whether it's the shipping routes that we need to keep global trade going. China gaining control of the Taiwan Strait would have a devastating effect here in the United States. And what we know with these authoritarian workers... And again, she's not wrong. Um, most other semiconductors in the entire world are made in Taiwan. That is a natural, you know, legitimate and strategic, um, you know, concern. Um, and that is something that we should actually look at doing. In fact, that is something that the EU is indeed looking at. Can it do? Can it set its own semiconductor um, factories up in, in Europe? That's what the EU is looking at because it is concerned as that. Even the US is looking, can they move um, semiconductor uh, or at least some semiconductor uh, manufacturing from Taiwan back to sort of the US or set up new factories to be able to do that? Work regimes working together is we can't divide the world into the Atlantic and the Pacific. What we can divide the world into is free democracies and autocracies. And that is the battle we're all fighting. And we can't just ignore the battle. The battle isn't going to go away. The battle is here, and it is the battle of our generation. Our adversaries are very clear that they're working together, and we need to work together. And I believe that we cannot abandon free democracies anywhere in the world. It will simply create a domination. Strange how she hasn't mentioned Myanmar. Just, just, just saying, guys. Um, you know, we care so much about... Um, Places like you know Ukraine and, and and obviously Taiwan, but so far in this speech so far she has not mentioned once what went on in Myanmar, which was a coup that is now being that country is now being run by a military dictatorship because they did not like the fact that they had democratically elected uh, quite a lefty leader. I wonder why Liz Truss is not mentioning once so far in this speech Myanmar. Maybe maybe someone should ask her what she thinks of, of what for Myanmar and what went on there. No effect. And I'm proud about what the United Kingdom has done to stand up to authoritarian regimes. We Also, what about um, Viktor Orban in, in Hungary? Uh, going to mention what Viktor Orban's done in Hungary? We're the first country in Europe to send weapons to Ukraine to help them defend ourselves themselves. And we led on the sanctions that were put in place on Russia and made a real difference. But there's no doubt in my mind that we need to do more. And we need to do more to end this war as soon as we can. That means supplying fighter jets. I'd like to see us in the UK supplying fighter jets. I'd like to see the US supplying fighter jets to help the Ukrainians. If that's the case, why hasn't, because I've never seen any evidence of Liz Truss doing this, bar this speech, why hasn't Liz Truss been lobbying to get the UK to send fighter jets to Ukraine? I don't, I don't think I've ever seen her once call for that, bar this speech. So that's the first time I've ever heard that. Will she maybe stand up in the House of Commons and say, we need to send fighter jets to Ukraine? I don't think she's going to be saying that anytime soon. Because this is all, you know, nicey-nicey platitudes. Like I say, she's trying to make somewhat of a political comeback after her disastrous short-term uh, prime ministership literally lasting six weeks and i think if the queen had not died when she did liz truss's premiership would have lasted even shorter because she managed to get at least a two-week reprieve from the queen dying so her premiership would have even been shorter and i also believe we should fast track ukraine's membership of nato we should have done it years ago but the best time to do <laughs> um you could not right ukraine could not join nato and the idea of of, of fast tracking um nato membership to ukraine just would not have worked 
because Ukraine and Moldova both have territorial disputes. You cannot join NATO if you have an ongoing territorial dispute. And Ukraine and Moldova both have an ongoing uh, territorial dispute with Transnistria. So even before the whole Russia thing, Ukraine could not join NATO. And the idea of trying to fast track their membership is a completely non-starter because in the charter, it is very clearly laid out. You cannot join NATO if you've got a, an existing territorial dispute. It's just that simple. It will be now. Because until they have that umbrella of protection, until they are able to be part of the NATO alliance, this instability will continue. And I think the fact that those in Eastern Europe who really understand the Russian threat more than anybody else are advocating it is so vitally important because every day longer this war takes will be more people in Ukraine suffering. There'll be a greater cost to rebuilding Ukraine for the free world after the war, but also the more that authoritarian regimes will become emboldened and the greater the cost for... So Liz Truss keeps on saying that um, because of the Ukraine and because of the lack of action, um, no, I, I absolutely think it was a sort of supplying weapons. I think we need to supply Ukraine even more because I think if Ukraine wants to win, we need to get the attitude across, or at least start with the attitude going, if Ukraine wants to win, then we have to start um, giving them the weapons they need to win the war. We've just sent tanks. You know, those leopards and challengers that are going to be probably being used during this uh, apparent upcoming summer offensive. So we're going to see those in action. But they need more stuff. More in particular, what they really need at the moment is something that has been echoed all the time. I know everyone's going to talk about the sort of the intelligence leak, but Ukraine from day one has constantly been asking for we need more ammunition. We need more artillery shells. We need more anti-tank, uh, you know, systems. We need more defense missiles. We need more offensive missiles in terms of sort of the HIMARS, so we can strike Russian targets. Ukraine just needs more, and I think the West has to get it through, or it's something the West has to move on to. Is if it is going to end this war quicker then we have to give Ukraine the weapons it needs to win the war. And until that gets through, um, you know, and, and, and I'm surprised that's not the message she's, she's, she's sending. She's instead sending, well, we haven't made any response at all. And we've emboldened dictatorial regimes. I think we've actually sent a very strong message. Putin has been isolated on the world stage. He is now being compared to Kim Jong-un. Russia is being mentioned in the same complete incompetence as North Korea. There has been a massive consequence to what Russia does. The idea that this has sent a positive message to you know, authoritarians or another country that might try this I think has overwhelmingly uh, said, if you try this, you will be punished for it. That is the message that has been sent. So this idea that, oh, nothing has happened? No, absolutely not. This, this is absolutely, um, no, absolutely not. But like I say, this is Liz Truss. She's not exactly that good at foreign policy. That uh, Bakura, <laughs> what, what have you clicked on? Welcome to Liz Truss's speech. <laughs> For all of us later on, of not acting now. But I want to be clear, supporting Ukraine is not a distraction from supporting Taiwan. And supporting Taiwan is not a distraction from supporting Ukraine. Putin and Xi have made it very clear that they are allies against Western capitalism. That's why I think it was a mistake for Western leaders to visit President Xi and ask for him to intervene in seeking a resolution to the conflict.
No, it wasn't a mistake. To, to call it a mistake is not to understand uh, foreign policy, or at least the pressure that Xi could put on Putin to end the war, because China has a lot, a lot of sway in Russia. And if you want to help end the war in Ukraine quickly, then you have to go to China and say, hey, Xi, you need to tell Putin, end this war. You need to tell him that this grand ambition of, of taking Ukraine is over. So leaders going to Z and saying that and expressing that is not wrong. It's diplomacy. It is basic diplomacy. And yet she is saying that is wrong. That that is we come across as weak. Then what should have we done diplomatically then, Liz? What should have we have done instead? I don't think she's going to offer a solution. In Ukraine. I believe that was a sign of weakness. It's also why it's wrong for President Macron to suggest that Taiwan is simply something not of direct interest to Europe. I don't agree with that at all. It is of direct interest to Europe. And I think we should be doing all we can to make sure Taiwan has the support it needs to defend itself. We should be working with G7 allies, including the United States, including the European Union, including our friends in the Pacific, Japan, but also other, other countries that aren't part of the G7, such as South Korea and Australia. We should be working with all of those allies to do all we can to support Taiwan now. And we need to put economic pressure on China before it's too late. We need to learn the lessons that we didn't learn on Russia. I'm proud that the United Kingdom has stepped up with the development of AUKUS. I think that's very important. Ah, yes, AUKUS, which <laughs> is, is, is very little um, strategic value, considering that this entire, um, obviously the year before uh, the Ukraine invasion, there was a massive sort of defence paper put out about like the, the the UK government, we're going to ascend, ascend, make a tilt to the Pacific to to show that we are there in the Pacific, and we're going to ignore Russia. the The days of grand land battles, the the days of these big tank battles, land warfare, they're all over. It's all about being the Pacific now. So the UK is going to make this grand tilt to the Pacific. What happens? Ukraine war. Oh no, we've got to rewrite our entire defense policy from scratch. I'd like to see Japan join. I'd like to see Canada join AUKUS. I'd like that to become a real Pacific-wide alliance. We've also signed an agreement with Japan, so we're going to do joint exercises and we're going to share intelligence. And the UK has also joined the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP, the Massive Pacific Trade Agreement. Again, I think that's important. I think it's important because I'm a free trader and I believe in free trade. But and it's going to have massive consequences to our, our country. Um, trust me, um, there is going to come a point where people are, are actually going to cotton on and realize, actually, there's a whole heap of stuff how the how joining the Pacific Partnership has been a massive detriment to the UK because, A, we're not in the Pacific. You've got the government recently admitting that actually the 0.08% is overinflated and it's probably from what we can now tell from some other experts who've come in, said actually the real number is probably something like 0.03%, which is even less. But I also believe it's important because it's a bulwark to China. And I urge our British government and any future British government that they must never allow China to join the CPTPP. What we need to find is ways of trading in a deep way with our friends and allies. Why? Like, like, why is it? Like, this is this is the, the, the big thing because it was obviously set up to be a be a bulwark against against China. But why is it such a disaster from 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 China joining? You know, joining the the CP. They've never actually said if China joins, what, what's the consequence? What's the, what's the what's the consequence of join of China joining the Pacific Partnership? Like, like, what's the negative?
they've they don't they've never really fully explained that except oh we can keep them out but what's what's the positive and the negative of keeping china out not with those who are seeking to undermine us and seeking to undermine freedom and democracy now i hope that the us will reconsider pulling out of the tpp it was a us initiative in the first place I believe it was a good idea. And if the US joins, first of all, it will be of benefit. To, um, remember, leaving the uh, TPP, where it was as was known at the time, united Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, and Bernie Sanders. I could not think of three people who have such differing political opinions, but all agreed on one thing that the TTP at the time was a disaster for, for Americans and a disaster for the American economy and that they probably should not join it. So I do not see Americans being overly eager to join this new CPTPP. That's too many Ts, but never mind. This is why we just call it the Pacific Partnership. <laughs> I do not see them rushing to join the Pacific Partnership anytime soon. And, of course, South Korea might join. These other countries might join. Emphasis on might join. Because the Pacific Partnership is not exactly this massive positive benefit that Liz Truss even makes it out to be. And like I say, we've done videos about all this. At Veep Crew, hello to you. Uh, uh, Shane and uh, Neilbert, good evening to you. And David, hello to you as well. To US consumers. Secondly, it will help strengthen Indo-Pacific security. And finally, now that the UK is a member, it will be a fast-track route to a UK-US trade deal. What is not to like? <laughs> oh, the, the mythical, the mythical, the, the true goal of, of Brexit. We could achieve this UK US trade deal. Oh, praise be. Yeah, I, I doubt it very much. I doubt it very, very much. And now more than ever, I believe our relationship, our strength is needed. Because we've got to ask ourselves after the success of winning the Cold War, why is it that authoritarians are on the march around the world? And of course, it's President Putin who's responsible for the appalling actions in Ukraine. But we have to ask ourselves, what was it about what we did that we could have done differently? And I fear that we showed weakness. We didn't invest enough in our defense. We didn't make sure that we were economically robust. And we made it easier for Putin to act. I, I, I completely disagree 100% with that analysis. The idea that we just sat back and and did nothing as as, as Putin has, has 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 gone into Ukraine is completely completely delusional. This is not a reflection of actual foreign policy. This is an absolute delusional abandonment of of what this woman thinks foreign policy is. Thank God she's not our prime minister. <laughs> Thank God they got rid of her when they did, because Jesus, the damage this woman could have done if she'd stayed around any longer and actually fulfilled some of her other crazy ideas. With impunity. And at the heart of that, at the heart of that, is the fact that our economies simply haven't been growing fast enough. Ah. We've seen low growth now for several decades. Oh, they haven't been growing fast enough. Oh, growth, growth, growth. Again, why do these libertarians constantly have this obsession for growth? Growth does not matter. It is not the be-all and end-all. But they are obsessed, obsessed with growth. And this is particularly acute, acute in the United Kingdom. Real incomes haven't increased significantly since the financial crisis. And the average GDP per capita in the UK is now 30% less than it is in the United States. 
Who? Which party, since 2008, has been the ruling party? Now, of course, there were a couple of, of Labour years, of course, since, 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 you know, 2008. But the predominant ruling party has been the Conservatives for the past 13 years. If Liz Truss thinks that, then she has to openly admit, or at least that would be or should be a tacit admi admission that her own party, which she has been a part of for years and been a leading figure in, even leading it at, at for, for a very brief period, has been an absolute catastrophic failure. That's a, that's a pretty big glaring omission if Liz Truss wants to admit that. That is not a good position for us to be in. It was much closer two decades ago. The symptoms that we're seeing are low growth. We're seeing high cost of living. And we're seeing real wages in having declining value. The disease is ever larger government. And we have to ask ourselves, with our economies in the state they are now, are we going to be match fit to take on China in the decades ahead? And are yes, we I think we are already pretty much fine now. That Not that we couldn't improve, we could always improve, but... Capitalism ...is better than Chinese state capitalism. The sad truth is what I think we've seen over the past few years is a new kind of economic model taking hold in our country, one that's focused on redistributionism, on stagnation, and on the imbuing of woke culture into our businesses. What the the imbuing of woke culture into our institutions? What, what is Liz Truss on? And and can somebody please take her off it, <laughs> please, please? I call these people the anti-growth movement, and they come in many shapes and sizes. They're the vested interest who don't want challenge and don't want competition. They've always been there. But they've been joined by socialist and environmental clothing, who in the name of combating climate change, insist that we should simply stop virtually every kind of economic activity. What? That is a colossal straw man. That is an absolute colossal straw man. That is a complete and utter straw man. I have never, ever heard any environmentalist ever say we've got to stop all economic activity. Who is saying that? Because even I would not agree with that environmentalist that we had to stop all economic activity that just wouldn't work oh this is again just a, such a straw man of what many in the environmentalist movement are saying that we need to become more sustainable that we cannot sustain this constant growth boner that people like Liz Truss are obsessed with So, growth, as we said, is not the be-all and end-all. There are plenty of businesses out there who, maybe they grow some years, but maybe they don't. But you know what? They remain profitable. They remain, you know, in the black, as they call it. They don't go into the red. But because they're not growing every year, they get branded by people like Liz Truss, who call them zombie companies that they shouldn't exist. Meanwhile, this company is probably providing, uh, who knows, uh, 50, maybe 60 jobs in your local area. And there may be other similar companies that also do that. And then we have the ESG culture, 
perpetrated by many in big corporations, where the focus is on hitting a diversity target or hitting a social target, rather than actually generating money. I'm just. For employees I was going to let her run for a while. Companies. And of course, this model results in more taxes. It results in more subsidies, and it results in more regulation. I think we can see that with President Biden's Inflation Reduction Act. It's going to cost U.S. taxpayers four hundred billion dollars. It's going to encourage U.S. industry to spend their time rent-seeking and going to the government for those subsidies. And it's also going to cut competitors out of the market, including companies in the United Kingdom. Another good example is the UK ban on fracking. This is despite the fact that energy costs in the UK are twice what they are in the United States. And what we are now doing is we are buying gas from America, frack gas, we are freezing it to minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit. Right, I'd ask, I'd, I'd ask what I've missed, but to be honest, it's Liz Truss. I doubt I've missed anything. <laughs> right. We're transporting it across the, United, across the Atlantic Ocean, and then we're regasifying it in Britain. Now, why on earth does that make economic or environmental sense? It simply doesn't. Or what about our defence industries that are struggling to get investment because they're not seen socially acceptable? Just as a time when we are using more weaponry to help support the Ukrainians, our defence industries aren't able to raise the funds they need in all cases because of some of these ESG requirements. Across the board, what we see is it's getting harder and harder. Wait, is... Oh my God. Liz Truss is seriously making the argument. Liz Truss is making the argument that weapons weapons companies aren't making enough weapons or ammunition because they're not woke enough. This is this is why I have said this before. This is why I don't cover culture war stuff because that line of, of reasoning that she has just put forward that weapons companies don't make enough weaponry because they're not woke enough so they don't get funding is absolutely nonsense. Like what what do you even say in, in response to that? What what do you even say in response to that? I, I, I've just got no response to it. I, I just don't even know what to say. <laughs> and harder to get things done, and it's getting harder to get on. Overall, the Anglo-American model of capitalism is being subverted. And the Heritage Foundation itself, in its own index of economic freedom, has shown that the US and the UK are falling down the league table. And in fact, the US, UK has now fallen behind Germany in terms of our level of economic freedom. I fear that our... Wait, you, so, you, so Liz Truss is going to um, accept information from the Heritage Foundation, which, let's be fair, was probably given to her because the Heritage Foundation probably helped her write her speech <laughs> that according to them a libertarian free market fundamentalist think tank according to them well America's just fallen behind all these other countries where you're no longer economically free as you used to be like what? Because we're too woke? <laughs> what? Oh. Our countries are becoming social democracies by the back door. Oh no, we're becoming social democracies by the back door. And what's what's bad about becoming a social democracy? There's nothing wrong with being a social democracy. Many of the NATO countries, which she's an organization that she's she's praised, 
are NATO countries. One of NATO's biggest um, artillery shell manufacturers is in NATO, is in, is in Europe. Apparently, again, we're, we're, we're too woke where we're not making enough, but you've got one of the biggest manufacturers of artillery, artillery manufacturers in the world. I think it's in Norway, or it might be in the Czech Republic. I can't remember which was. They are making shells 24-7. Um, and we've ended up in a culture where too many people and too many businesses expect a bailout. Now, one of the core beliefs... <laughs> Wait, what? We're, we're living in a, in a time, according to this, just where too many businesses expect a bailout. I, I haven't seen businesses being given bailouts, certainly since 2008. I, I, I don't see that. <laughs> but, again... Please, citation needed, Liz. Please, citation needed. This is this is a lecture. I'd, please, give please give your citation on that. Piece of Margaret Thatcher was a belief in personal responsibility. It was the idea that it's down to you how you get on in life. That through your own ideas, your own hard work, through your family, you can make your way in the world. That was the core. Except sometimes you are born into factors you cannot control, and as a result. No matter how hard some of these people have worked, they have never been able to achieve the same economic wealth. Not everyone can become a millionaire or even a billionaire. That is just the fact of life. So you cannot cater your entire democracy, your entire economic foundations, that everyone is going to become a million and billionaire because it doesn't just work like that. But this is the belief that, that Liz Trusses has. Oh, anyone can become a million, a billionaire. Meanwhile, the realities of that are very, very farly different from what they from Liz Truss would like to be. Oh, uh, Dog Tan, I am sorry. Um, I'm sorry about the audio quality, by the way. Um, this is actually the Heritage Foundation's audio. It has actually somehow managed to get worse. I can barely hear her, and I've got her turned up as as high as possible. Like, Liz Truss is turned up as high as possible. She will not go any higher than this. Um, this is just terrible right-wing audio. <laughs> and yet, that's the case. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry that, uh, that you can't hear Liz Truss, but maybe I'm doing you a favor. <laughs> idea but i think that notion has been eroded and i think we can all understand why back in the financial crisis many people who made the wrong decisions in the bank didn't feel the full responsibility and accountability for what they'd done they were bailed uh, wait so you're you're Liz Truss is now making the argument that the people who were responsible for the 2008 financial crash should probably face some actual responsibility for their decisions exactly what the left has been saying for years and it was conservatives who said oh no they're they're not responsible they're not responsible meanwhile the only country that punished their bankers but the 2008 financial crash was Iceland, I believe. And went in a colossally different direction to everyone else. Instead of going down a path of austerity, they went down a path of investment. Out. And lots of people ask the question, well, if we're going to bail out some of the richest people in our society, why shouldn't I be entitled to some money from the government? And that's the culture we've created. So we've ended up in a situation following the financial crisis and following COVID, where there was even more money given out and supplied by... <laughs> Wait, so we shouldn't have given money to people during COVID. 
what should have we done? Should should people have just worked through the pandemic and then the virus would have ripped through thousands of more people's lives even more? Crippling businesses because so many people were, would be constantly off sick. Gee, sounds like a good idea that, Liz. Oh. Honestly, if, if that's Liz Truss's idea of how we got through the pandemic, I am glad that Boris Johnson was in charge. And I, you wouldn't catch me saying that for any other circumstance. By the government. And in the UK, that amounted to £400 billion. I think in the US, it was $5 trillion. We've ended up in a situation. Yeah, and what would have happened? What would have happened? If you had not given that money out, like, this is what you don't hear from these people who insist that this was a a good idea, or it was a bad idea not giving out money. Like, what would have happened? What would have been the economic consequences? What would have been the loss of life? Liz Truss is coming across, to be honest, as a bit of a psychopath. Where people see the government as a concierge. I've got a problem. I'll call the government. You know, my business is failing. I'll get on the phone and sort it out. My investment isn't doing very well. That does not happen. You cannot call up the government and just say, yeah, my investment's not doing well. Can you bail me out? That does not happen. Liz Truss is, well, she's on something, and she's certainly making up lies right there, because I guarantee you, if she was challenged on that, she would not be able to substantiate that claim. I can guarantee you that. It's the government's problem. I can't buy a house. I need to call the government. Yes! It is the government's fault you can't buy a house because the government hasn't been investing in building houses. You've left it all to the private market, which, according to people like Liz Truss, is the gold standard. The private markets will solve everything. Except when you look at the housing crisis, it is an absolute disaster. And I'll tell you now, as bad as the housing crisis is in the UK, I am glad I do not live in Ireland because I have heard some horror stories about people trying to buy a house, a new house in Northern Ireland, having to partake in lotteries. And you have to win that lottery in order to be able to qualify to buy a house. If you know, I'll say it now. We've got it bad here, but oh boy, it's it's like ten times worse in Ireland from some of the stories that I've heard. But I wouldn't be surprised if we end up like them, uh, like going that way as well. And also, we should also mention, as this is the Margaret Thatcher Freedom Lecture. Much of this problem was started because Margaret Thatcher started to sell off massive stocks of, well, social housing and then not replace them. Gee, I wonder how we ended up in this housing crisis. Hmm. It's a mystery. A mystery we may never, ever solve. <laughs> but I can tell you as somebody who's worked in government for many years, that is not the answer, and it's not sustainable. Because that never happened. Please, trust. give us an example. Please, give me an example of that happening, of you being phoned up by a business asking for a bailout. And give us the circumstances as well as to why they were asking for a bailout, so that it's not someone saying, yeah, it's covid I need a COVID loan because if not, my business is going to go under. Because I think that's a legitimate reason for a business to ask for, you know, money from the government. 
but you're making out that anyone who runs a business can just phone up and just ask for money from the government. I don't think people really understand how big the government's actually got. If you listen to some of the left-wing media and the left-wing commentators, you would think we're living in some kind of Ayn Rand skeletal state. We are. <laughs> we are, because the Conservatives have slashed all the funding for certainly local government to the bone. And the response from the Conservatives is, you've got to do more with less. It's not true. At the turn of the millennium, the state was spending 29% and 36% of national income in the United States and the United Kingdom. Today, those figures are 35% in the US and 47% in the UK. I wonder how that, if that has anything to do with COVID. I wonder if that has anything to do with COVID before she moves on about that. I, I think she's being very misleading with those figures. That is virtually half of every pound in Britain is now being spent by the state. Why is that a bad thing? Again, conservatives say state spending is bad, but why is it a bad thing? If you think giving the money over to, to private businesses and, and corporations works, why does it work for giving it to private ent enterprises and companies, but doesn't work if you give it to governments? Where we have seen studies time and time again that has shown that businesses, that, that the governments investing in the country has always produced an overwhelming economic benefit versus just giving it to private corporations because it doesn't end up benefiting the country. It normally vast parts of the time ends up in, you know, shareholders' back pockets. It all makes, makes the eras of Bill Clinton and Tony Blair look like some kind of libertarian paradise. And I really worry that if we don't change course now, those figures are going to get even worse. Because all of this state spending just creates more demand. More demand for subsidies, more demand for higher taxes, more demand for regulation. It becomes a vicious circle. And everybody who's affected, the entrepreneurs, the businesses, the landlords, they look to the government rather than looking to what they could do to get on. <laughs> well, that That's a very warped view of the world. Um, but then that's a typical libertarian view, so. <laughs> and this has been aided and abetted by the central banks with artificially low interest rates, pumping more money in and keep... Artificially low interest rates. Uh, again, this is this is the idea that, um, that interest rates should not be low. And the reason why um, these zombie companies are allowed to uh, succeed when in reality they should be they should be sort of dying so that new companies can come forward and take their place is because of these low interest rates well interest rates are not low at the moment because of inflation because of list trusts especially in the UK at the moment keeping that whole system going now the reason i'm in politics and the reason i remain in politics is I don't believe that's what ordinary voters want. I don't believe that this is the society that people in Main Street in the US... Uh, really? Um, I can't speak for the US. Um, but time and time again, when we've seen polls of where people have been asked, they want high regulations. They want these things. The Brexit campaign, which Liz Truss campaigned against, said time and time again that no, we are going to main, make sure and maintain that Britain remains these high regulations and high standards, that we are not going to lower them. And yet, Liz Truss was on the other side saying, no, you don't understand, if we leave, they'll lower them. And now she's on the side of the Brexiteers who lied about that and are now trying to lower them. 
and she's now advocating to try and lower regulations when she was on the remain side during the referendum and saying no britain should have high standards high regulation or the high street in the uk actually want to see i believe that people want to have control of their own lives develop their own futures people have control of their own lives and they can develop their own futures Again, please cite me some examples where this apparently is not happening. Have their own businesses. I don't believe they want to be dependent on government handouts. People aspire to a higher standard of... Then why did you not, as part of the government, invest in pro programmes and projects which could help people do that? Again, when she was in power, when she was, again, a government minister, she didn't practice what she's currently preaching. But then, again, this is typical conservative free market fundamentalist nonsense. You say one thing, but you mean something completely different. Living, They want their children to have a better life than they had. And that is what we have to deliver. But it's becoming harder and harder to deliver in this low growth world that we're now living in. Now, when I was in number 10 Downing Street, I tried to change this. Oh, dear. I think if you are somebody who's not worked in government, you perhaps don't understand quite how hard it can be to get things done and to make that change. Boris Johnson said it was like one of those nightmares where you simply can't move your feet. Tony Blair talked about the scars upon his back. And I'd spent many years in government. I knew it would be difficult. You you crashed the UK economy and you almost destroyed the UK pensions industry. Will she bring this up? <laughs> I don't think she will. But I still didn't understand quite how hard. In my 10 years as a minister, I've seen all kinds of producer interests, whether it was the legal establishment, the education establishment, the environmental establishment, the agricultural establishment, all of these groups often don't want to see the status quo change. The... That is absolutely completely false. They want a good, functioning, well-run government. That does not always necessarily mean the status quo. And government and groups do want sometimes vastly different things. But, oh... Yeah, exactly, number three. It can be hard to do wrong. <laughs> it can be hard. So hard to do wrong. <laughs> She's still unrepentant for her, for her actions. There are people who work in businesses that invoice the government, and they're doing quite fine. Thank you very much. There are executive agencies who like having power without having responsibility. Can you name one? Go on, Liz, name one. If there's, This is the executive government, this body that has power without responsibility name one she won't and there are also the people who live in the beltway or they live in london they live within the m25 and they've been enjoying quite a nice life they've been enjoying high asset prices cheap goods from around the world cheap labor and they're comfortably off they don't want to see the status quo changed all of those people are part of the resistance to the change we need to see Why, in all her 10 years as a minister, did Liz Truss not advocate for David Cameron's Northern Powerhouse idea? And why was she not a campaigning hard for the levelling up agenda? Something which she abandoned. In fact, most of the Conservative Party establishment just abandoned it wholesale. Why wasn't Liz Truss standing up with Michael Gove saying, we are going to level up the rest of the country? Why did she not advocate for policies or, or, or anything that would solve this problem? Again, this is, this is the Liz Truss fantasy that she lives in. My word. Exactly, V. Ten years. How how crazy are we keeping her in power? I know it it, it's, uh, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but um, 
<sighs> yeah. And as Prime Minister... And oh, they managed to fix the audio, I've realised, at last. I simply underestimated the scale and depth of this... <laughs> Oh yes, she Liz just merely just underestimated destroying the British economy, almost wiping out the UK pensions industry. Yeah, just underestimated, underestimated doing that. You know that that, that, that very small thing. Resistance and the scale and depth to which it reached into the media and into the broader establishment. My plans for tax cuts and supply side reform were about making Britain more competitive. They were about making us a more successful country where we were less reliant on government. And I told you we were up to 47%. I don't think we were. I, I really don't think we were. In fact, let's 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 fact check that now. Um Oh no, Liz Truss is actually right. <laughs> Shockingly. Um, according to the Office for Budget Responsibility, um, we are actually at, where is it? Um, oh, I've lost it now. So the total spending was one thousand one hundred and eighty nine billion pounds. Yeah, so here we are. How much will it spend on things like public services, state pensions and debt interest in 2023, 24 and 24? We expect to spend at least one hundred um, uh, uh, one point eighty nine billion pounds or equivalent to to uh, £24,000 uh, per household, or at least 46% of national income. Okay, fair enough. List Trust is actually right there. But what if we don't spend this? This is this is the even the even bigger question. If, if we don't spend this money on, on public sector and, and things like that, then what happens... But also, something else she misses out is that the public sector, and this is quite interesting, the public sector raises about 41%, yet uh, yeah, 41% of national income. So that's interesting that um, we, we, we actually, the public sector manages to make money. But according to Liz Truss, that's not the case. <laughs> Those plans were backed by Conservative members across the country. Oh, no, they weren't. Oh, no, they weren't. <laughs> oh, no, they weren't. But we face coordinated resistance. But we didn't just face coordinated resistance from inside the Conservative Party. Or even inside the British corporate establishment. We faced it from the IMF and even from President Biden. Yeah, and the, the British economy just crashed because she was promoting this massive swathe of unregulated, of unsupported uh, tax cuts, which was going to cost the British economy billions of pounds. Billions of pounds. So my warning to you here today is it's not enough just to have the right ideas. It's not enough even to have broad support for those ideas. 
Oh God, we're oh God, we're only twenty minutes in. We've been going for how long have we been going for? We've been going for an hour and a half. Oh no. We need to be able oh, to no. How long have we got left? Oh thank God, there's only ten minutes left by the looks of it. Take on those who resist change and who don't want change. And we need to be able to ensure that we're winning the argument enough to be able to do that. But your side has, again, you won the Cold War, you continued with your ideas, and now your ideas don't seem to be working as well as you claim they are. That's why there has been a big change in that, just to make that point. And we need to start preparing now. Because we're now facing a wider problem, which is one of the reasons that I've come here today to... Washington and come to the Heritage Foundation. The national stagnation problem that I've been talking about in both the US and the UK is now becoming an international problem. Because not content with high taxes in their own countries, we see governments seeking to agree high taxes around the free world. I'm talking about the OECD minimum tax agreement, which will stop countries lowering things like corporation tax and becoming more competitive. In my... <laughs> Again, the... the 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 only way a business can be more competitive is if they have lower taxes. Oh, let's just ignore any business innovation that, that that gets made or gets done. Look at the amount of companies that actually got set up during the pandemic. There were quite a lot. It's actually quite a surprising number when when you look into it. There were a lot of businesses that did start during the pandemic and did actually quite well because they were digital based businesses. They didn't actually have to have sort of physical face-to-face -face meeting is, of course, the wide adoption of, of sort of Zoom and, and sort of things like that. There were a few companies that did quite well during the pandemic because they didn't need sort of a, a physical workforce. But do they want to sort of support that now? By the looks of it, not, not really. Um, it would be interesting to know what Liz Truss's thoughts uh, and thoughts and think of sort of the wide adoption of working from home. Um, I wonder if she's probably not for that, because after all, that might be someone's personal choice that they want to work from home. D d should a business take that personal choice into account? I don't think Liz Truss would like that, <laughs> to be honest, because, uh, again, according to sort of the libertarian, businesses always come first. My view is nothing short of a global cartel of complacency. Because what will be the effect of these high taxes? Well, it will mean lower growth it will mean higher lots of other countries seem to have a lot higher tax rate than us but they're doing all right they seem to be doing all right <laughs> you know they seem to be doing a lot more state spending and, and they're investing in in their economies and in infrastructure and you know what a government should probably be doing <laughs> spending and it will mean ultimately that we are less competitive against our adversaries around the world and less economically strong. And what we're seeing is those on the left are... Uh, again, please, uh, please say why Russia's economy is absolutely in the toilet with all those sanctions that we have placed on it. Yeah. Again, this is Liz Truss just living in a complete fancy world, and and it is the, the libertarian fancy world. Uh, we you would normally get this type of ridiculous nonsense from you know random libertarian YouTubers, but apparently it's now coming from Liz Truss. Politics working together to put policies in place across the free world that essentially tie the hands of government and prevent them taking the actions to making their economies more free and their economies more successful. You mean? voting liz you mean people voting not to follow your crazy libertarian ideas that sounds pretty democratic to me liz <laughs> it sounds pretty democratic unless you're saying that uh oligarchies um are in reality the, the way forward um in in, in which that case is is was putin uh, the the perfect country to to live in putin's russia because it, that's an oligarchy and i believe in the way that those people are working together we who believe in low taxes who believe in free enterprise need to work together to combat those challenges so how do we do this because it's a massive task 
and frankly, things have been moving in the wrong direction for some time. Well, first of all, we need to start at the core problem, which is the challenge to our core Anglo-American values. We've allowed our opponents to fill the airwaves. We've allowed them to crowd our campuses. And we've allowed them... Wait, allowed them to, to fill the airwaves? Um, especially in, in, in the UK. Again, I can't speak for America because I, I don't know what the sort of number would be. But in the UK in particular, the right wing has a massive monopoly on on the news here in the UK. That is why they're so dead set on trying to sell off the BBC, because if they do that, they will probably be able to get a complete stranglehold. They're able to get a complete and absolute stranglehold on, on the British media, even more so than they do now. To use our institutions to undermine our values. We share a great heritage of freedom between our two countries. You know, the US Constitution, Magna Carta, there are many founding documents that I could mention. But that freedom is being undermined. And of course, we need to be self critical. We How is that freedom being undermined? You haven't really stated, you've said words that, oh, this is a bad thing, but you haven't stated why it's gone on to, to be such a a, a disastrous thing oh my god that they're, they're taking over our, our airwaves and campuses again it's not a reflection on the reality and when she's had some of a bizarre foreign policy takes like oh putin is getting away with it putin is absolutely not getting away with it there has been an overwhelmingly good response against putin's invasion of, of ukraine so that is once again another fantasy that she's bizarrely indulging in. We should subject ourselves to self-examination. We believe in a free press. But what I think it's come to is self-flagellation. Self-flagellation of the values that made our countries great in the first place. Identity politics, which is basically the idea that what group you're in is more important than the person you are. Critical race theory, which says it's more important how you appear on the side. I, I really don't need to respond to this because this is just has this has nothing to do with her uh, her arguments these these arguments have nothing to do with the grander I, the the ideas that she has been saying how how do any of these fit into like you know combating russia or the economy that she's been talking about again buzzword bingo purpose than what your talents and attributes are or the whole debate about what is a woman that completely subverts basic principles of science and biology. These are all core beliefs that we have seen being undermined. And I'm afraid there hasn't been sufficient fight back. Now, before I was prime minister, I was minister for women and equalities. And one of the things I did is I stopped gender self ID in Britain without a medical certificate. But that is what had been happening in Britain. But what we don't see is we don't see enough people prepared to take the orthodoxy on. And I find it ironic that there's so much criticism within our own societies and yet so many people also trying to migrate to our countries. I know that the United States has problems at the Mexican border. We have problems in the English Channel with small votes. And we're in a situation where people in our own societies appear to be questioning the very value of what we are, whilst others are desperate to get into the country. And it's an extraordinary contradiction. <laughs> so what can we do about all this? Oh, what can we do? Ooh. Because this isn't just a problem about our own societies. Or our own countries. This is what this we're is waiting for. This is this is what I, I would hope for. The, the answers. With all this complaining about how bad the West is, that all this nonsense is is going on. She hasn't actually provided any examples of of stuff going on. Um. Again, all oh, migrants, whatever. But this is this is an absolute fabrication absolute fabrication of the of of the world as it currently stands for the future of the world that we need to deal with we need to be as organized and we need to be as fearless as our opponents and first of all we need to be proud of our core values and we need to tell the story of freedom again we need to make sure that people understand the benefits of living in a free society they need to understand again what does this freedom actually mean because as we've said before, 
people, when they have been asked and they have been polled, have time and time again rejected these libertarian fantasy ideas. And when Liz Truss ran her grand experiment, she almost crashed the, well, she did crash the UK economy and almost destroyed the UK's pension industry. Understand what individual liberty means. We need to challenge those who seek to cancel people and we need to be brave in speaking out. And we need to challenge those who subvert the law of biology. And there's only one thing we can do, which is speak out every time this happens. We need to be intolerant. That's it. We need to speak out. That's it. And and bear in mind, she bear in mind, can can you imagine how, how grandiose this speech started off as as we need to be taking on China and Russia. The West isn't doing enough to yeah, we're having too much state spending. Why oh state spending is so terrible. Well, not only telling what her, her alternative would be. She said nothing about that. But again, because she doesn't want to tell that, because, well, someone might come and say, well, actually, there are consequences if you want to strip away all this state spending, because guess what? We're seeing those consequences right now of what has happened in the UK when we've stripped away all this social spending and this investment in social services completely stripped away, stripped to the bone. And now, oh, culture war issues. And her grand idea, how do we solve this? We need to speak out. That is absolutely pathetic. Where's her policy? Where's her ideas of how are we going to fight back against uh, or this, this supposed threat? Well, well, the... Again, it is it is a threat, but you know this threat from Russia and China. How are we going to solve these big answers of of the the economy where we see more people turning away from capitalism into more sort of you know we want to see more industries here in the UK. We want to see more regulations. This just doesn't have any answers to that. This is need be nothing but buzzword bingo. And a complete and absolute denial of reality in Liz Truss's ludicrous fantasy world that she lives in. Where, in reality, she did nothing wrong when she was Prime Minister. Oh, it was just, just you know, though that, that terrible orthodoxy that put me down. Of intolerance. And we need to tell the truth about what happened during the Cold War. I find it incredible that the younger generation now seem more favorably inclined towards communism and socialism. We need to tell the story. <laughs> communism, debatable, but people are, and more younger people, are cutting on to the idea, well, actually, socialism is not all bad. Because they have been told for years that socialism is a dirty word, that you can't do this, that socialism doesn't work. But... We see in other European countries who adopt social ideas or socialist policies that do work. So is it any idea where Liz Truss says we're facing all these challenges? She hasn't got any ideas, any actual policies other than, oh, well, we just need to speak out. We need to, we need to tell the truth about the Cold War. Well, as we discussed at the beginning, you may remember when we talked about the Cold War. One of the big contributors as to why the Cold War uh, came to an end was because, well, the US, because of its economy, could massively outspend Russia. And it spent so much on its defensive budget that when it had an economic hiccup, it could no longer pay for its massive, massive military output. It was one of the many things that contributed to the fall of the USSR. That's history. That is actually being taught. You do get taught modern history. You do get taught about the Cold War. But of course, according to Lystris, oh, we, we're, we're not telling the right history. 
because you know as we've said before reality has this awful left-wing bias <laughs> that right-wingers like liz truss love to hate of the crimes that took place in the ussr the types of society that existed then and we need to tell the truth about how freedom delivered and how it was achieved the second thing we need to do is recapture the language the left have weaponized people's concerns about the economy and environment using terms like fuel poverty and the climate emergency. Yes, people do experience fuel poverty. It is not a buzzword that the left made up. It became a phrase under the conservatives because that is what happened to many old people. They found themselves in fuel poverty, that they could not afford their heating. And this was even before the current energy crisis that we face. And climate crisis, of course there's a climate crisis. We can see it happening all around us. We can see what the effects would be. But it's people like Liz Truss who refuse and have refused for years to accept that there is any climate stuff going on. And we're only now starting to see governments react to this. You've seen America, with its Inflation Reduction Act, massively, massively invest into green technology. We're seeing the EU massively invest into green technology. And what's the UK doing? Nothing. To justify policies which are anti-growth and socialist. Maybe we should talk about rising taxes as tax poverty and the fact that we have the highest taxes for 70 years as a tax emergency. <laughs> oh, oh, tax poverty. Really? Can you, can you show me the people that have been fallen into poverty because of taxes, Liz? Because we can show you plenty of examples of people who are in fuel poverty. And a tax emergency? I don't think you would cause a tax emergency by taxing people just a little bit extra. And maybe rather than a cost of living crisis, what we've actually got is a cost of government crisis. <laughs> oh, oh, it's a cost of government crisis caused by your government. We need to reduce the size of government and make our economies match fit. We live in a big... Again, if you're going to reduce the size of the government, what is it you are going to say that the government is no longer do, going to do? If you bang on about that constantly, what is it you no longer want the government to do? Because if you're going to reduce the size of the government, you are saying the government is not going to do specific things anymore. What are those things you want the government to no longer do? I have a feeling, because again, you can see the Heritage logo behind her, I have a feeling... She wants to privatise the NHS. Big government era. And the problem with that, of course, is a lot of people with an interest in the government remaining big. So we can't win the battle without changing those incentives. We should follow the example of US states like Florida and Texas. That, that are doing, I think, the worst out of all the states. Correct? I, I, I'm, Americans correct me out there if, if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure Florida and Texas are like the worst performing out of all the states. And I think only Texas only manages to survive partly because of its massive oil industry. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. That are changing things, whether it's on occupational licensing, tax cuts, school choice. These are the types of policies we need to pursue. And we also need to look at countries like Poland and the Czech Republic in Eastern Europe and their economic dynamism. Fourthly, Poland is very socialist when it comes to sort of business and when it does all this, I'm pretty sure. They would never, ever do this in a month of Sundays. Remember during the beginning of the pandemic where people say, oh no, you don't understand, we need to be more like Sweden. Sweden, who has a massive social safety net compared to certainly the UK and many other things that people like Liz Truss would never touch in a month of Sundays because that's too socialist. Believers in freedom need to link up across the Atlantic and beyond. We need a network of liberty, not a cartel of complacency. We need a UK-US trade deal, not a UK-US tax deal. And we need a race to the top. We shouldn't be putting regulations on each other. 
I would love to see America rediscover free trade and reject protectionism, or as President Reagan calls it, destructionism. That doesn't mean we should allow piracy, intellectual property theft, or unfair state subsidies. I believe we should be much tougher on trade with China. And acting with friends in the G7, we put sanctions on Russia. We can use trade restrictions on China to force change. I want to see the UK adopt the technology restrictions on China that the US and Netherlands have as a starting point. In conclusion, I presented quite a gloomy picture over the past 30 minutes, I can see the audience agree, of what's happening in our countries and the threats we face. But I don't... Uh, what Liz Truss has, has, has presented is a complete fantasy. It's a complete fabrication of, of, of many things. <sighs> I believe hope is lost. I don't believe this for a minute. Because we've been here before. We know what it feels like. I was born in the 1970s, which was a dark decade for Britain, a dark decade of industrial crisis. But what we saw is we saw the birth of new ideas. We saw an intellectual revival on the free right. And then we saw the election of a conservative prime minister, Mrs. Thatcher in 1979, who won hearts and minds and changed our country and together with President Reagan, changed the future of the world. Last autumn, I had a major setback. <laughs> yeah. That's what it was. Just, just a major setback. Just a major setback. That's all it was. She didn't crash the economy. Didn't, didn't nearly destroy the UK pensions industry. Just a, just a bit of a major setback. But I care too much to give up on this agenda. I think it's too important. And I know there are others who care too. I know there are people who care in the UK. I know there are people who care in the US and beyond. There has been absolutely no substance in this speech. This has been Liz Truss decrying every single thing we hear normally from the right-wing libertarians. Oh, taxes are too high. There's too many regulations. The government's the government is too big. She has provided no policy in how to solve these problems. No policy whatsoever. The solutions that she's put forward, it's not policy. Nonsense. And over the coming months, I'll be setting out ideas about how we together can take this battle forward. We all need to think about what we can do. We need to get real about the threat from authoritarian regimes and their unwitting allies in the anti-growth movement in the West. We need to get organized about taking these forces on. And we need to fight this battle of ideas once again. Mrs. Thatcher would have expected nothing less. Thank you. Oh, thank God. Oh, thank God. It's over. It's over. It's over. Oh. Um. Um. We've been sat here for two hours listening to the nonsense of Liz Truss. And that's what it is. That was absolute nonsense. Yeah, you are right. Um, not, uh, Nar Nargel, <laughs> I think that's how you say your name. Yeah, you are right. That is, that is basically, that sums up libertarianism. They just cut policies, they don't make any. Because as far as they're concerned... The government should be there. Yes, I was, GC. I, I did speed her up towards towards the end because I'm like, I can't. I have to try and find a way to finish this quicker. But even then, Jesus. Oh. That is a complete and absolute fabrication. That was buzzword bingo. There was all complaining and the usual complaint that we hear constantly from people on the right oh taxes are too high the government's too big there's too many regulations well okay what's your answer if you do that you're going to face these problems what do you think as we've said many times you poll people on regulations they want high regulations they want good standards And warlords of the chat, Ikit Claw or 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 or, 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 or,
Ickit Claw. I'd go for Ickit Claw. Ickit Claw's campaign's more fun. Launch some Doom Rockets, Duke Vengeance. <laughs> Doom Rockets all the way. Um, oh, and yes, by the way, tomorrow is Forge of the Chaos Dwarves. Finally! Finally! <laughs> I get to wreak my um, my dwarfy vengeance uh, on the Karazhan Core. <laughs> the Dowies are will rise from the dark lands. <laughs> but yes, I'm looking forward to that, to that uh, tomorrow. Um, oh, but yeah, like, like I say, I, this, this, oh, what to sum up on this? Um, it, it, it's nonsense. For those of you who just heard me talking about Dowie Zar and Karaz and Kor and uh, what, whatever, what are these things? Uh, don't worry. Uh, that's generally what I, I think is should be the response to to a lot of list trust has said here. It, it just seems like absolute nonsense because that's what it is. It's it's complete and utter nonsense. It's a complete fabrication. List trust is still living in La La Land, when reality in her head she is like the UK's greatest ever prime minister, even though she only lasted six months. Six not six months. Six weeks. And I, I still, I was still maintaining this. If the Queen had not died, right in the middle, I think she would have lasted even shorter. She would have lasted an even shorter time. I absolutely maintain that. She would not have lasted too long. But again, she's going to con keep on continue spewing this nonsense. And she's going to keep on spewing it in, in forums like this where no one can speak back to her or as it all goes on. Again, it, we'll probably cover uh, the question and answers, and answer sessions maybe in a, a separate video. Maybe we'll maybe I'll punish myself <laughs> doing that tomorrow. Um, I'll, I'll see how I feel. I say I'll, I'll watch it through and see what questions she gets asked but oh oh good lord that was an absolute rejection of reality um i just don't some and some of the stuff especially the culture war stuff how how do you even respond to some of those just those stuff like weapons companies can't make enough weapons because they're not woke enough What? <sighs> Again, yeah. Dong, uh, Dongto, yeah. My work here is done. My work here is indeed done. I've been doing this for, for long enough now. But, oh... That, ladies and gentlemen, was hard. That was some seriously hard going through this. What an absolute nonsense world Liz Truss has put forward. So, for those of you who have, who have stayed with me for these two hours or, or joined us, Thank you very much for joining us. Please do remember to click on the like and share button on your way out. Like I say, down below, there's my Patreon page. There's my one of today's link called Buy Me Coffee. I'm certainly going to need a coffee tomorrow or at least something stronger <laughs> to try and regain some brain cells from this because that's how ridiculous this 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 nonsense lecture from Listrus was. <sighs> but, oh boy, as always, thank you very much, uh, for joining us today and as always we'll see you all next time but oh boy <laughs> i forget how ridiculous liz truss really was thank god we got rid of her when we did like i say ladies and gentlemen britain's shortest serving prime minister wrecker of the economy and almost destroyer of the uk pension industry that's how liz truss should be known and i think the Heritage Foundation should probably amend their description. Um, why not go over to the Heritage Foundation's YouTube channel before, uh, after you've uh, liked and shared this video and go and comment that um, that should be added to their uh, description of this trust. <laughs>
because that's what she did. And of course, remember, shortest serving prime minister in UK history. Go and remind uh, the Heritage Foundation of that. <laughs> but as always, thank you very much for joining. And of course, as always, guys, thank you so much as always for joining me in this. <laughs> this, I, I don't know what, it's fried my brain. <sighs> but as always, thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you all next time.